morning, everybody. I'm going to call this meeting of the State Government Finance and Elections Committee to order. Today is March 15th, um, and pursuant to House Rule 10.01, this meeting is being held virtually. Um, Mr. Brinks, can you take the roll? Thank you. Chair Nelson. Present. Nelson is present. Vice Chair Carlson. Carlson present. Carlson is present. Representative Nash. Nash present. Nash is present. Representative Bonner. Present. Bonner is present. Representative Dreskowski. Present. Dreskowski is present. Representative Elkins. Elkins present. Elkins is present. Representative Greenman. Present. Greenman is present. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn present. Cleborn is present. Representative Kosnick. Present. Kosnick is present. Representative Mason. Mason present. Mason is present. Representative New Brindley. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski present. Pulowski is present. Representative Quam. Present. Quam is present. Representative New Brindley. Present. New Brindley is present. Chair, we have a quorum. We have a quorum. Um, the next item on our agenda is approval of the minutes. And Representative Elkins, did you get a chance to look at the minutes from March 11th? I have, and I will move their approval. Representative Elkins moves approval of the minutes for March 11th, 2022. All in favor, if you want to unmute, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Um, the minutes are approved. Uh, the first bill we have listed this morning is House File 3696, Representative Schultz. And um, I'm going to make the motion to refer House File 3696 to health, the Health Committee. Uh, members, we heard this bill last week, and there was some question about the fiscal note. And uh, according to the fiscal note, it has no cost to our, our budget. Um, so I'm going to have Ms. Ms. Roberts explain and verify that. And with the, uh, um, the fiscal note, explain the fiscal note. Ms. Roberts, if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I'm Helen Roberts from the House Fiscal Staff, and you do have a um, fiscal note from Minnesota Management and Budget, which oversees the CGIP um, program. And I'll point you to the very end of that um, discussion on the fiscal note. It says C CGIP does not anticipate additional administrative fees from its health plan administrators to provide this new value-based reporting to MDH. It is possible that new reporting requirements could be passed on an onto CGIP's administrative fee in the future, but CGIP anticipates no fiscal impact at this time. So members, uh, we had a good discussion. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. Uh, members, we had a good discussion of this bill last time, but, but as, as it has no cost to us, I'm gonna, we're gonna vote on this and uh, um, to move out to where health, the health committee where it needs to be heard. So, um, uh, Mr. Brings to, um, I'll, re I'll renew my motion that House File 3696 be referred to the Health Committee. Um, Mr. Brings, please take the roll. Thank you. Chair Nelson. Aye. Nelson votes aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Aye. Carlson votes aye. Representative Nash. No. Nash votes nay. Representative Bonner. Aye. Bonner votes aye. Representative Dreskowski. No. Juskowski votes nay. Representative Elkins. Elkins, aye. Elkins votes aye. Representative Greenman. She's got it. She's, she's presenting a bill. Another committee excuse her for this. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn, aye. Cleborn votes aye. Representative Kosnick. No. Kosnick votes nay. Representative Mason. Aye. Mason votes aye. Representative New Brindley. No. New Brindley votes nay. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Pulowski votes aye. Representative Quam. No. Quam votes nay. Chair with the vote of seven ayes, five nays, and one excused. The motion prevails. The motion prevails. The bill's on its way to the Health Committee. Um, the next bill we have on our agenda, members, is House File 2856. Representative Keeler and Representative Keeler, welcome to the committee. And I'll move House File 2856 be referred to the General Register. Representative Keeler, if you want to explain your bill. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm really excited to be here to talk about this. Um, I just want to make sure that we all know that I'm entering into this space with an open heart and an open mind. This conversation is not meant to be harmful in any way. Um, what this bill does is it, recognize, it, it recognizes the second Monday in October as Indigenous Peoples Day, um, as an Indigenous woman who stands unapologetically Indigenous in front of everybody at every moment. This is something that's extremely important to myself, but also members of my state, members of my community and across this nation. Uh, this has been a movement um, in other states, starting with South Dakota in the 90s. I grew up in South Dakota and I remember this taking place and how amazing it felt to know that we were part of the conversation. I think this is a pure statement of inclusivity and the importance of understanding and recognizing that Minnesota alone has 11 sovereign nations and is 100% ceded treaty territory land. I think that it is extremely important that we value those relationships um, by honoring Indigenous Peoples Day. I'll yield the rest of my time because I know that we're on a really short time frame, um, and I have two testifiers here today with me, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Representative Keeler. I have three people on my list. Um, the first one is, I'm going to butcher this name, Adosh Uni um, from the Department of Education. Welcome to the committee, and I apologize if I butchered your name. Mr. Chair, you nailed it. That was quite impressive. So I appreciate that. Mr. Chair, committee members, my name is Ado Shuni. I am the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of Education. And thank you for allowing me to testify here in support of HF 2856. Uh, MDE is happy to voice our support for this bill. On October 14, 2019, Governor Walls proclaimed the day Indigenous Peoples Day in Minnesota and has to done so in all subsequent years. Our state is honored to have the highest serving Native American woman in state office with our Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan, member of the White Earth Nation. Recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day has been a stance that the governor, Lieutenant Governor, and the commissioner are proud to uphold. It is far past due that we as a state elevate, validate, and honor the voices of Native people who are the first residents of the land upon which we sit now. Our schools are not only a place of learning academics and materials, but also understanding how subject the subject applies to the world around them, the people around them, and their surroundings. Our tribal nations are distinct government bodies, not just our neighbors and community members, whose role in and contributions to our country is deserving of a day of recognition. Native Americans have a long history on these lands, have strong cultural beliefs, and they are an integral part, uh, integral part of our country's history, present, and future. MDE believes that a, a body of people with so much to contribute to our students' learning experience is important to hold space for. MDE's Office of American Indian Education and the Indigenous Education Specialists continue to stand ready to provide schools with information and resources to be able to speak about Native history and culture accurately and holistically. Again, the Commissioner and MDE are happy to support 2856 and thank Representative Keeler for her work to elevate the importance of Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oni. And if you hang around for questions, um, the next person I have on my list is Shelly Buck, the Tribal Council Vice President of the Prairie Island Indian Community. Ms. Buck, uh, please state your name and proceed with your testimony. Hello, my name is Shelly Buck. Good day, everyone. I greet you with a good heart and a handshake. My Dakota name is Manny Buffalo. My English name is Shelley Buck, and I am the Vice President of Prairie Island Indian Community. Indigenous Peoples Day is important to honor the past, present, and future of Indigenous people. It is important to recognize the impact of colonialism on Indigenous communities that still affect us today. We are invisible in our own ancestral homelands. This invisibility leaves indigenous people vulnerable to continued experiences of prejudice and discrimination. Indigenous Peoples Day celebrates and brings awareness to our cultures, contributions, and resiliency. With this day, we can start teaching the full true history of Minnesota and start to build a bridge between cultures. We have to stop the erasure of indigenous people and stop the celebration of genocide. This country has been celebrating the genocide of indigenous peoples for decades. This does damage to indigenous children as well as non-indigenous children. 
it gives the perception that this land was barren of people and ripe for the taking or to be discovered. When in reality, it was already inhabited by people who had thriving communities, economies, and cultures. Tribes are focused on changing the narrative within our own communities to ensure that future generations never forget who they are and remain guardians of, our, of their heritage for generations to come. Despite all the years of federal policies to assimilate or eliminate native people, we are still here. The fact that I am here before you today is a miracle or some people have called it an act of defiance, defiance against those very policies. There's a saying that if you don't learn from history, you are doomed to repeat its mistakes. Recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day is one way to demonstrate that we have learned from the history of genocide and you are committed to making sure it never happens again. By passing this bill, you affirm that Native histories matter, Native cultures matter, that I, as a Dakota, we all matter. Pidama Yayepi, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Buck. And if you can stick, stick around for questions, that would be, be great. Um, the next person I have on my list is Robert Larson, president of the Lower Sioux Indian Community in the state of Minnesota. Um, Mr. Deuce, or Mr. Larson, excuse me. Well, me talk, yeah, be. Uh, chair and members of the committee, that is our traditional greeting as Dakota people, as we believe all of us and all things are related. Dakota, yeah, to talk to each town, town, yeah, no. English, yeah, Robert Larson or Deuce. Um, my Dakota name, very loosely translated, truly takes more than a day to get the true meaning of my Dakota name. Uh, but very loosely translated, it is Rolling Bull. And I share with that, share with you because I think it's important for you to know who you're talking with and who I'm talking with. So when that lead bull sees trouble coming like a storm and they gather the herd and that lead bull faces the storm and everything happens and it, it passes by and he looks back and sees that things are good and everyone survived. That's when he's rolling in the ground and kicking up dirt in celebration and thankfulness that, that his herd has survived. So I, I share that with you in a good way. And I am president of the Lower Sioux Indian Community in the state of Minnesota, our federally recognized name. Changshayapi is the area we've traditionally called this part of Minnesota. And I also serve as the chair of the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. Today, I'm here in my official capacity as president of the Lower Sioux Indian Community to testify in support of House File 2856. Minnesota has been in the forefront of tribal state relations, and that's something the state has done right and should be proud of. That's under many of your leadership. To counter the harmful narrative that a man, Columbus, who never set foot on North America, of whom documented acts of genocide exist, honored as a hero is hurtful to many citizens of Minnesota, especially indigenous people. To acknowledge the Dakota as the original caretakers of this land and celebrate our existence through our schools is a wonderful step forward for tribal and state relations and honors our state and tribal partnership. It's a day to pause and reflect on our shared history and commitment to work better together. When we know better, we should do better, right? And this is another chance to do just that, to do better together. The more our young people and staff that support them know and learn about the true history of our land, the better chance we all have of working to, for a better future. I just want to share that yesterday we had an all day session with one of our local schools that they came out to the reservation and learned about who we are from us. And this is the third year that that we've done that sharing with them and the relationship has become so much better. It's not perfect, but it's so much better than when I went to school. This is part of that that would help that. And for any great undertaking, it's never, it's never enough for a person to depend on themselves. So I ask you all to receive this in the spirit in which it's offered 
as another way for us all to move forward together. Kadamiya, and thank you for your open minds and hearts on this wonderful undertaking. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Larson. And with that, um, members, questions? Uh, Representative Claiborne. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I would like to thank Representative Keeler for bringing this bill forward. Um, every time I hear someone say, and I'd like to acknowledge the fact that we're on Dakota land, right? The acknowledgement is great, and I'm glad that people are saying it, but it always leaves me with this space. And, and <laughs> what are we doing about that? Um, we um, all have to acknowledge our history and speak to that truthfully. And part of being a resilient uh, state is also being very truthful. So I just wanna thank you for bringing the bill forward. Um, the words that I heard today, which really uh, struck me, uh, and all of your words are valuable, but the acknowledgement that before, um, before anyone else arrived, there were thriving communities, thriving economies. And to be able to say, yes, I see that. Yes, I acknowledge that is a very important part of being truthful about where we are today. So I just wanna thank you for one, being vulnerable uh, Representative Keeler and bringing this forward, knowing that not everybody in our state is going to agree with renaming a holiday or just acknowledging the indigenous people that are here today. That takes great courage and great strength. And I wanna honor that in you uh, and let you know that I see that in you, not in just this bill, but in all of the bills that you bring forward, recognizing the needs of our indigenous community. But to be able to give me an opportunity to stand with you today on this bill and to honor the indigenous people of the state of Minnesota, um, I, I thank you for that opportunity. So it is, um, with that, that I just wanted to acknowledge the importance of this bill, standing with you, and I ask our colleagues to do the same as well. This is the and, and we are bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Claiborne. I didn't hear a question there. Um, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Representative Keeler, um, I appreciate the content of this bill, I do. And I, I um, after I moved away as a kid to Colorado, uh, studied many things such as the, the massacre at Sand Creek and the, uh, the undertakings of the shameful Colonel Chivington and, and others. And I, I, I do think that there is a worthy effort here. But I, I want to point out on and ask you to maybe explain it on lines uh, starting on 1.15 through really 1.22, but on particularly 1.16 that you are pres prescriptively requiring schools to de uh, dedicate an hour of the day through legislation. And, and please, you haven't had the, the opportunity to be here in committee when I present some of my bills, but you have seen it on the floor. Very often, the mantra of local control gets uh, waved as a flag and, I don't think. and many people are um, deeply offended by some of the efforts that I bring to, to change some of the, the efforts uh, that municipalities have relative to housing and the local control mantra is, is uh, chanted. So I'm just asking, this seems to tell all school districts who either may have more or none at all, but this is what they are going to do from a prescriptive perspective. And I, and I know your caucus is all about uh, the mantra of local control, but could you maybe walk through that, uh, the part of your bill and then the local control aspect so that if school districts chose to go in a different direction, and, and I'm not saying that they should, but, but it is a, a, a plausible argument. So if you would. Ms. Keeler, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Nash, for the conversation, or Representative Nash, I'm sorry. Thank you, Representative Nash, for the conversation and the question. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the things that we talked about when this bill made the stop in education policy, as that's its realm. When we were there, um, a couple of things that I want to highlight is that, yes, we added that language saying that if a school is in observance of that day, meaning if 
they're in school in session. So if a school district really doesn't want to do this, this could be one of the days that they're not in session on school. However, the reason why we took that language is we used other language that's in the statute. If you read shortly up above that, it, it talks about um, Martin Luther King's birthday, Lincoln's birthday, Washington's birthday, Veterans Day. If they're in session on those days, they're required at least one hour of school programming to be devoted to patriotic observation. And so if we're going to talk about local control and what we can and can't do in those spaces, that was already in statute. Um, in that space. And so we just use that example moving forward to provide in this language some examples of what some schools could do, because that was other conversation that came up in questions is what are some of the things we can even do um, in this space. And so I actually just took some of the language that was already in there. Um, and that's how we came up with our language in that capacity. Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I do believe that I see that it says on line 1.1 or 1.9, it says may. Um, so I, I think there's a difference between permissive and uh, prescriptive language. Is that not accurate? Representative Keeler. That's accurate. Representative Nash. And, and again, Representative Keeler, I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish the bill, but the, 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 per, the permissive language in 1.9, and I, I would love for us to, to celebrate our history, both good and bad, because that's, that's our history. And I, I truly do mean that. And, and mem members of this committee will attest to the fact that when we were talking about some of the, uh, uh, I think it was racial impact notes from a couple of years ago, I actually amended the bill to require the participation of uh, of our sovereign Indian nations. And Mr. Chair, I think you remember that amendment. Um, so I, I have been an advocate for treating our history exactly the way it is and treating its native peoples um, with the dignity that they deserve. But I, I just have a problem with permissive language on things like Lincoln's and Washington's birthday, uh, Martin Luther King's birthdays. So that's, that's permissive. But now this is being prescriptive, and I, I do think that there is an inconsistency there that I would hope that you would amend that to be permissive, uh, because the ones that are above it are similarly permissive as well. Are you open to that, Representative Keeler? Representative Keeler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Nash. I'm open to conversations, especially if they're conversations to get us to the end goal that we're trying to really address here, which is inclusion and understanding of Indigenous Peoples Day. I'm honestly open to conversations about how we get this to a space that we all agree is important. Um, and so if that's the spirit of the conversations, I'm more than happy to have that conversation with you. Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I'll, I'll be done now, but I, because it is, it is prescriptive language right now, I'll be voting no. I am very open to changing my vote on the floor to a yes, because I do, again, think it's important that we talk about the, the history that we have. It, it is, America is, is both a fantastic and, and shining beacon in the world. And we have, we have some parts that I'm not proud of. So we should talk about those things. But I, I do find that the inconsistency, uh, particularly given the comments of many when I bring bills um, about the local control is, is really it's an incongruency that I think you're going to want to address. And I think that many people will will point that same out. And it sounds like you had that conversation in a previous committee stop. So it, it sounds like it's not just me making that commentary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Nash. Uh, Representative Quam. Miigwech. And forgive the pronunciation. I try to um, inject different uh, languages into um, the legislative process. Um, inclusion means adding to uh, and, and making more full, uh, not replacing. Um, I understand why this is a replacement as opposed to, but I, I just think it would be more inclusive if there was added a different day. Um, some of us remember when they replaced profiles of learning with the, the standards we have now. I was involved in the science standards and the group that came together to do the science standards 
uh, selected me to chair the writing committee. At the same time, the social studies was going through and boy, science was easier because, uh, you know, one is one, uh, you know, things are, are concrete. History, um, there are so many different perspectives. Um, I wish that the spirit of inclusion could be more fully involved by um, strongly encouraging, you know, using language to strongly encourage the inclusion of, um, ad, you know, the addition uh, of the stories that probably haven't been heard. Um, one of the things I learned in that standards work was you don't teach the same thing across all grades. And kindergarten students having someone come in and, and, and show some culture would be a little different than what you would with uh, high school students. Um, because there are several different tribes across Minnesota. Um, having been a former school board member, um, how I would look at the inclusion would be first look, is there a, who are the local tribes? Um, are there some younger people that could come in and speak to the kindergartners and the elementary? Are there some young adults that could come in and speak to the high school students? But also in high school, you have different sections of history. So maybe some people take it in the beginning of the year, some take it um, towards the end of the year and having it as part of, in the curriculum of uh, those uh, courses and sections, I think would be much more illuminating than, okay, we're all going down to the, uh, to the gym or the auditorium or whatever assembly location for one hour, um, I don't think the intention would be there. I think having it embedded in the most related and appropriate sections of courses would add perspective, would gender a discussion in a classroom as opposed to uh, sitting there in a gym next to your, 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 your friends where you tend to be distracted. So I think there's a better approach for the inclusion. And I would hope that uh, this would evolve and include some of those better uh, approaches because to make a difference, the environment and the action and the content should be aimed and adjusted to the situation. Um, otherwise, I, I think you lose an opportunity. So I would, I would hope that the author would look at a uh, more inclusive way of, of adding this. And, and now I've, I've, I've had my say and, and thank you and have a good day. Thank you, Representative Quam and members. I, I just want to remind you that we are the state government finance and elections committee. Um, the, seems the discussions we've been having are discussions that are for the education committee um, under their purview. And this has already been at the education committee so that uh, we are here to discuss the state government finance piece of this bill. Representative New Brinsley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Keeler. Um, I think Representative Nash brings up a really important uh, point on consistency in, in the language in the statute. Um, and I, I will take just a little bit different approach to that. Representative Keeler, I know I've worked with you before, and I know that what you do is in good faith. And um, I, I am happy to vote yes on this bill today um, with that understanding that we'll We'll work on making sure that that language is consistent moving forward. Um, I actually, I, I think there's a lot of value in this bill and I appreciate it. Um, 
And frankly, uh, there's nothing terribly remarkable about the history of Columbus Day. I mean, it's more about the fact that he was Italian than, than anything else. Um, there's nothing particularly remarkable about that, but I, I do think there um, is value in recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day. But again, um, I think there is an issue with consistency in the language. And um, if we really do have your commitment uh, to work on that moving forward, I'm, I'm happy to vote yes on this today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative New Brindley. Representative Kosnick. <laughs> I was just trying to get the video going. Um, you know, I appreciate the, the celebration uh, of your culture, Representative Keeler, and your advocacy for it as a Latino American. Uh, I, I understand where your, your intent and heart is. The issue that I have with this bill is that it's also canceling out other people's history and culture. Um, and so that's where I, I won't be able to support this. Um, you know, not everybody's perfect, and I certainly acknowledge uh, some of the uh, atrocity and um, imperfections, or lack of a better word, but um, the, with the, the history of, of colonization and, and such. But I think we also have to, and when we look back in history, uh, measure people that we've been celebrating uh, for a particular, a very well-known reason, um, the totality of a person's achievements. And, you know, if you look in, um, in Wikipedia, you know, the ex expedition that inaugurated a period of exploration uh, across the world is a significant achievement. And what I think your bill does, it doesn't, it not only just uplifts the indigenous culture, but it, it's canceling out uh, another culture and some achievements that other people are, are uh, celebrating, and I think rightfully I should be celebrating the bravery and the um, navigation skills and exploration on that. So uh, if you weren't canceling out uh, some of that, uh, I think I'm, you might be able to earn my support. Um, and quite frankly, I think there is also, uh, if you read further in, in about this issue, uh, there is a, a current of anti-Catholicism involved in it. And so I, I think we have to be very careful with what uh, we're doing with the language. And so I think it's important to state on the record. Uh, I do appreciate your efforts, uh, but I don't think this is uh, exactly how we should be going about it. So I will not be supporting it. And those are my reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Kosnick. Representative Mason. Thank I you, Mr. Chair. I haven't heard many questions, but Representative Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Keeler, I have just sent you a real detailed letter that I received from someone. Uh, again, it's concern about uh, the advocacy of the Columbus Day for Italians, but more important, he, uh, he mentions that there is a ind Global Indigenous Peoples Day on August 9th. Native American Day is the fourth Friday of September. American Indian Heritage Day is the Friday after Thanksgiving. So my question is, what ha you know, is there a way of deleting, all those to me are all pretty similar as, you know, and relate to yours. So the, the question is, why did you arrive at uh, putting it against Columbus Day virtually against using some of these other holidays? Representative Keeler. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Mason. Um, we engaged in this conversation before and I'll just reiterate what I said in that moment. Um, and thank you for bringing it up in this space is that um, there are many holidays that celebrate many other things, multiple holidays. I don't know that there's a limit to what we can have. This is a national movement. There are many other states. There are states around us that do this, there are also cities within our own state that have made city resolutions to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day. The idea is understanding it, and I wanna go back to Representative Kosnick's statement in the fact that like, one, I appreciate that you use Wikipedia to get your information, but as we're celebrating a man who discovered something, we have to note that he ended up in the Bahamas. So he didn't even end up in our nation as a discoverer. So 
um, Representative Mason, one of the things I want to bring up is that there are other holidays that the Italians or other immigrants to this state can can celebrate. There's a federally recognized holiday on October 28th that is Immigrants Day that is open to celebrate and understand all cultures of the immigrants who came here versus an individual who I think we can all agree when we start to dig in to the individual's actions, he's probably identified as a bad actor. And so this is a national movement. This is a movement to say we are part of the conversation. Um, and, and that's where we stand with this. We have states and, and cities that have moved this forward. We're just falling in line with that um, to move forward in a collective movement. Representative Thank Mason. You. No, Representative, Rep Representative, Thank you. Car Representative Carlson, quickly, and we're going to get to a vote. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Representative Keeler, I just want to say thank you for bringing this bill before us today. It's long overdue. Uh, fully support what you're putting forward today. And uh, uh, this is just um, a piece of legislation, I think, that is important for uh, our young people to know about our state's, uh, our country's history and in going forward. So uh, I think this is something that we should all support and proudly support uh, this effort and um, see this through and looking forward to everybody getting on board with this because this is uh, this is important uh, for our state. This is important for our country. This is important for us uh, as Americans. Um, and just uh, real quick, um, Representative Keeler, uh, in terms of, uh, there were some comments made. If you could just in your closing remarks, I don't need an answer now, but in your closing remarks, maybe just to kind of ground us in terms of uh, what is actually permissive and what is required. If you can kind of just reiterate that in your closing comments, I, I think that would do us all uh, a bunch of good. So thank you to, uh, for bringing this today and I fully support your bill. And I, I did, Representative Nash had his hand up and it's down. Um, Representative Keeler, if you wanna do your wrap up and then we can get to a vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, as I'm looking into the bill and trying to have an engaging conversation, um, 1.15, that line actually states that after all of the holidays that I had mentioned earlier, it does say at least one hour of the school program must be devoted to patriotic observation of the day. Uh, not that I'm not open for conversations around that. Um, so I've, I've already reached out to other members um, and we'll, we'll build on that because I do wanna do this in a collective space. I wanna do this in, an, in a space that we're just being part of the conversation. Um, I really appreciate the engaging conversation, the space that we're in, and the ability to do this for our next generations. I say over and over and over. I am here as 1% of this population. I grew up not seeing people who looked like me in many spaces and conversations that weren't being had about the people that I come from. And so that's all this is doing, is it's engaging and it's increasing a conversation that includes all of us. Um, I appreciate the ongoing conversation and, and we'll work diligently behind the scenes to have these inclusive conversations on how we can get this to the best point that we all can support it. Thank you for your time. Uh, no, normally we'd go to a vote, but Representative Nash, your hand came back up. You have a quick yeah, comment. Mr. Chair, thank you. Just very briefly, please, for those that are watching, do not conflate a potential no vote with somebody speaking against the idea of this. Uh, once again, I'm, I'll be voting no, and maybe others will be voting no from uh, the irregularities of the permissive and prescriptiveness. Um, so please do not um, unfairly treat people who vote no on this as being anti uh, this issue. Thank you. Uh, with that, members, Mr. Brinks, I will I'll renew my motion that House File 2856 be referred to the General Register. Um, Mr. Brinks, please take the roll. Thank you. Chair Nelson. Aye. Nelson votes aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Carlson, aye. Carlson votes aye. Representative Nash. No. Nash votes nay. Representative Bonner. Bonner, aye. Bonner votes aye. Representative Drazkowski. No. Drazkowski votes nay. Representative Elkins. Elkins enthusiastically votes aye. Elkins votes aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Greenman votes aye. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn, aye. Cleborn votes aye. Representative Kosnick. No. Kosnick votes nay. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Mason votes aye. Representative New Brindley. No. New Brindley votes nay. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Pulowski votes aye. Representative Quam. No. 
Palm votes nay. Chair, with a vote of eight ayes and five nays, the motion prevails. The motion prevails. The bill's on its way to the general register. Um, I'm just getting a note here, members. We have to go back to the Schultz's bill um, that it needs to go to judiciary, not education. We were given the wrong information. So, members, I will um, bring. We'll go back to bring up the uh, uh, house file. Get the number right here. It's the house file. Where's Schultz's bill? Thirty-six ninety-six. Thirty-six ninety-six. Thank you. I'll, I'll, um, I'll move that we reconsider House File thirty-six ninety-six. Um, members, all in favor of that, please say aye. 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 Opposed. The ayes have it. Um, I read. Uh, with that, I'll change my motion um, at House File thirty-six ninety-six be referred to the Judiciary Committee. All uh, members, Mr. Brinks, do you want to take the roll? Thank you. Chair Nelson. Aye. Nelson votes aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Aye. Carlson votes aye. Representative Nash. No. Nope. Nash votes nay. Representative Bonner. Aye. Bonner votes aye. Representative Dreskowski. No. Dreskowski votes nay. Representative Elkins. Elkins, aye. Elkins votes aye. Representative Greenman. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn, aye. Cleborn votes aye. Representative Kosnick. No. Kosnick votes nay. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Mason votes aye. Representative New Brindley. No. New Brindley votes nay. Representative Pulaski. Pulaski, aye. Pulaski votes aye. Representative Quam. No. Quam votes nay. Representative Greenman. She should be excused. I think she's still presenting her bill in the other committee. Chair Nelson with a vote of seven ayes, five nays, and one excuse. The motion prevails. The motion prevails. The bill's on its way to the Judiciary Committee. Um, with that, hope we're done with that bill for now. Uh, members, the next bill on our agenda is House File 3910, uh, Representative Richardson. I will move, uh, uh, for right now, I'll move the bill to have it in front of us. Um, my understanding that there's been a late amendment that's come forward that, we, that needs to be dealt with. And so we're going to hear the bill, then we're going to lay it over. And when we get the amendment sort sorted out, we will then bring it back up and, and get it voted out. Uh, Representative Richardson, you want to present your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. House File 3910 would establish Juneteenth, which is celebrated June 19th, as a state holiday. Some are under the mistaken impression that the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 ended the brutal institution of slavery. However, as the Civil War ended, there were still thousands of Black people that remained enslaved. It is a reality how freedom in this country has always been delayed for Black people. In Minnesota and across the U.S., July 4th is celebrated, and it's about freedom and liberty, but it's an imperfect freedom because slavery still legally existed in this nation. To be clear, Black men and, uh, contributed to the independence of our nation and fought in the Revolutionary War in a time when the vast majority of Black Americans were enslaved. Abolitionist Frederick Douglass eloquently pointed out the paradox of this imperfect freedom in his July 5th, 1852 speech, what to the slave is the 4th of July? The celebration of Juneteenth provides the space for all of us to reflect on a more inclusive freedom. The end of chattel slavery in this country is a, mi a milestone worthy of recognition, reflection, celebration, and a step towards the commitment to a progress to truly living up to the promise that all are created equal. It's a chance to acknowledge how far we've come and how far we have to go. Before I turn this over to my testifiers, I would just like to take a moment to recognize the late Representative Richard Jefferson, who passed away last year that began this conversation back in 1996 and brought more recognition to Juneteenth with his work at the legislature, which was unanimously supported on the House floor by his colleagues uh, to recognize uh, Juneteenth. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to yield my time to my testifiers. 
And before we go to the testifiers, Ms. Roberts, there's a fiscal note on this bill. If you want to explain the fiscal note. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, members, again, Helen Roberts from the House Fiscal Staff. Yes, we have a um, fiscal note from Minnesota Management and Budget that states that um, two things. One, that any administrative effort required to administer this was um, minimal and there are no costs attributed to that. And then there's discussion about how um, this impacts state agencies and that um, Juneteenth is already established as a holiday in the collective bargaining agreements that have been passed so far um, by the subcommittee on employee relations and have gone into effect. Um, the only piece that is not addressed is the assumption for state agencies that are not yet, um, those collective bargaining agreements have not yet been agreed to, or um, for example, the legislative branch or the judicial branch that uh, don't, aren't addressed by MMB. But um, the MMB portion um, clearly states that they're not anticipating any cost. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. Um, I'll go to the testifiers. The first testifier we have is Lee Jordan, State Director, State and Regional Director for National Juneteenth. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. You're, you're muted, Mr. Jordan. Um, I'm not kidding hearing Mr. Jordan. With that, why don't we go to Ms. Weeks or Ms. Oh, Ms. Ms. Moore, uh, Meredith Moore. Again, identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hello, my name is Meredith Lee Moore. Uh, and today I come to you as a tax paying homeowner in Mendota Heights, a business owner, a parent, and a descendant of Africans brought to this country and enslaved. Uh, thank you, State Government Finance and Elections Committee for allowing me uh, to speak in favor of House File 3910 to make June 19th a, a state holiday. And thank you to Representative Richardson for this opportunity. Uh, I was born on July 5th, and I always enjoyed watching the fireworks on July 4th, but I grew up celebrating my freedom on Juneteenth. Growing up in Minnesota, I often found myself teaching my peers, my neighbors, and now my colleagues about my history and felt confused about why they didn't know about this important part of our nation's journey. I would explain to them how enslaved people in Texas were not told about the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 because it was illegal to read or write, and that about 250,000 Black people continued to suffer under chattel slavery until the Union Army arrived in Galveston on June 19th in 1865. I would tell them about how Juneteenth marked the beginning of reconstruction and opened the doors for our families to reunite and begin the journey to equality that we're still walking today. I remember Juneteenth fondly and I celebrate it now with my boys and House File 3910 is part of recognizing our country's progress and teaching our diverse community where our struggles stem from. Former State Representative of Texas, Al Edwards said it best, every year we must remind successive generations that this event triggered a series of events that one by one defines the challenges and the responsibilities of successive generations. That's why we need this holiday. Let us preserve the legacy of our ancestors and recognize their unpaid labor to build this country. Let us honor their fortitude and strength by recognizing June 19th as a state holiday that marks the end of chattel slavery and the beginning of a new chapter that we're still writing today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Great testimony. Um, is Mr. Jordan, I see he dropped off my screen. Mr. Jordan, are you with us now? Can I see you now on my screen. Can you uh, unmute yourself and then again, identify yourself or proceed with your testimony? Can you go? Yes. Uh, my name is Lee Jordan. I'm the Midwest and State Director for the National Juneteenth. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties. Uh, I'm just here to just, first of all, to thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you about Juneteenth. I have been involved in, Ju in the Juneteenth celebration for over 30 years. And like many people in our community, 
uh, that history has not really been fully explained, celebrated, or commemorated. So it is important, you know, as much as possible to, to let everyone know how important Juneteenth is, not only just to the African American community, but to all, because none are free until we all are free. And the important part about Juneteenth is the fact that, yes, you know, it took a while for the information to get to Galveston, Texas. But just remember, Galveston, Texas was not the only state in which held, you know, their slaves a little bit longer than they should. Yeah. So Juneteenth gives us that opportunity to not only to talk about the history of slavery, but to talk about the contributions of African-American people here in America. Because the important part of, of the title is that we are the United States. So if we are the United States, the main thing to do is to include everyone in a celebration that commemorates freedom so that all might be able to tell their freedom story in a way that is important, not only to our youth, but for those that have gone on that can't, that don't have a voice that, you know, that we can speak for them. Yeah, the contributions that are important, not only to the African-American community, but to the world at large. Because Juneteenth is not just some a single day of celebration. It is, a, it is a continuous, you know, information being shared, being brought out. So Juneteenth is, as far as I'm concerned, such an important part of American history and not just African-American history. So, and, and Minnesota has celebrated Juneteenth from, you know, for many, many years, but mostly it got into the newspapers around 1986. So from 1986 to this present day, we have been celebrating Juneteenth over on the north side of Minneapolis mainly, but there's also smaller celebrations as well. So it's important not only to talk about that history, but to give everyone an opportunity to understand the importance of Juneteenth as a celebration and a commemoration of history. And yes, Frederick Douglass did speak to President Abraham Lincoln about the importance of letting African American sold um, African American slaves, you know, become a part of the fight for freedom. Because he said, if you give the U.S. colored troops their opportunity to prove that they are valuable and important to the cause itself, they would actually be able to win the war. In fact, they did. So it's so important to just understand we are talking about the importance of history here in America and not just African-American history. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Thank um, you. Any questions, if the two are hanging around, any questions for the author or for the testifiers? Mr. Chair, I had one more uh, testifier, Mr. Reynoso. Oh, well, I, he's not on my list. Sorry about that. He's not on my list. But Mr. Reynoso, if you want to um, identify yourself for the tape and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, Edward Reynoso, I'm the legislative and political director for Teamsters Local 320. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to, first of all, thank Representative Richardson for bringing this forward. It's, it's long overdue. And I, I really want to thank also um, uh, Mr. Jordan and Mrs. Moore uh, from from bringing the historical perspective, uh, I think it's really important. Uh, this is, a, I, we believe, a, a very important bill on several issues. Uh, so I also want to bring forward the issue that we have. Uh, while it's it's recognized as a state holiday for state employees, and as um, was mentioned earlier by Mrs. Roberts, uh, it's already recognized, and and employees in this, at the state level are already receiving uh, that as a holiday. Uh, what we have a, an issue with right now is through the collective bargaining process, employers in the public sector, which we represent thousands of, of, of members, are sometimes refusing to recognize Juneteenth as an official holiday until it's on the list of official state holidays. Uh, passing this law, one, is way long overdue, and two, clarifies policy for local municipalities and government agencies and further encourages the private sector, but does not require to also treat it as such. So with that, um, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify on this bill and we uh, Teamsters are, are in solid support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reynoso. 
Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't, it was, your name wasn't on my list, but that's, that's fine. Uh, again, questions. Um, I see no hands popping up. Uh, Representative Richardson, if you want to do your wrap up and we can get to it, uh, we can, then we can lay this over and look forward to your amendment when it comes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Nelson. I just wanted to uh, take the moment to uh, be able to thank both uh, Mr. Jordan and uh, Ms. Moore for uh, their, their testimony and also, also Mr. Reynoso for uh, bringing the perspective of, of state um, employees as well. Um, as has been stated, this is something that is long overdue. It's, uh, it's a step um, uh, towards progress, and I appreciate the opportunity to present today, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Ruth Richardson. And uh, with that, members, we'll lay this over, and uh, again, we'll bring it back up at a later date when we get the amendment worked out. Thank you, Mr. Representative Richardson. The next bill we have on our agenda is House File 778, uh, Representative Stephenson. Um, I'll move that House File 778 be referred to the Judiciary Committee. Um, Representative Stephenson, you wanna present your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this bill legalizes sports betting in Minnesota. Let's be clear from the outset that sports betting is already happening in Minnesota. We have a robust black market here. People just use shady websites, digital workarounds, and other means to place bets. What this bill is about is creating a legal marketplace that will displace that black market, and in doing so, provide consumer protection, ensure the integrity of the game on the field, and limit money laundering and other illegal activity. In 2018, the Supreme Court struck down longstanding federal law prohibiting sports betting in states other than Nevada and New Jersey. Since then, over 30 states have legalized sports betting. All of Minnesota's neighboring states, including Canada, have legal sports betting. This is an idea whose time has come. Having said that, it is important to get this right. This is the biggest change in our state's gambling laws in 40 years. And so during the interim, I engaged with every stakeholder I could. I traveled the state from the Red Lake Nation in Northwestern Minnesota to sports data companies located in downtown Minneapolis, listening and trying to develop a Minnesota specific model for legal sports betting. During that process, I consulted with all 11 of the tribal nations located in Minnesota, along with our professional sports teams, the University of Minnesota, sports betting companies, and experts on problem gaming. I also examined the law in the other states that have legal sports betting, and I even took a field trip to Iowa. The product of all of this work is a bill before you today. This bill includes both brick and mortar sports betting at tribal casinos, as well as statewide mobile sports betting operated by the tribes in partnership with commercial operators. To put that in plain terms, if this bill passes, Minnesotans will be able to visit sports betting lounges at casinos all across Minnesota, and they'll also be able to wager on sports on their smartphones anywhere in the state. We would tax mobile sports betting at a level consistent or below states around the country. The money generated from this tax would be dedicated to three causes. First, the regulations and consumer protections necessary to make sure that sports betting is fair and doesn't influence what is happening on the field, particularly at the amateur level. Second, we devote 40% of the tax revenue generated to addressing and treating problem gaming. We need to be honest here. Most people can gamble without issue, but for a small subset, it is a real problem we would devote more resources than ever before to confronting this problem. Finally, 40% of the tax revenue raised would go to funding youth sports and other youth programming around the state, but with particular emphasis on communities experiencing a high level of juvenile crime. Juvenile crime is at unacceptable levels in Minnesota. And while there's no single cause or one single solution, we know that when kids are playing sports, they're not getting into trouble doing something else. It's taken a lot of work to get the bill to this point, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Members from both parties have come with me to ideas about how to improve the bill, and I'm very open to including those ideas. We still have multiple committee stops in front of us, and so I'd like to encourage members to keep those ideas coming. One that I will mention right now, multiple members from both parties have said to me uh, that they would like to see the age uh, that gambling is legal for, in terms of sports betting on the mobile side, from move from 18, which is what this bill says currently, to 21. 
Uh, we've been exploring a lot of different opportunities for how to do that or a lot of ways to do that. Uh, but I think we've uh, just in the last day or so reached a conclusion that the age should be 21. And uh, unfortunately, it's too late. We, we reached that conclusion too late to adopt that change in this committee. We were past the amendment deadline. But I do want to just say publicly that uh, I will be uh, bringing an amendment uh, in the Judiciary Committee, the next stop for this bill, to change the age from 18 to 21. And members on this committee have my commitment that that will happen uh, in the next um, committee. Mr. Chair, I do have an amendment that is ready for this committee, and it deals specifically with the jurisdiction of this committee relating to the Amateur Sports Commission, fleshing out the grant program uh, programs that we uh, uh, would house inside that uh, uh, entity uh, related to youth sports and integrity of the game. So if, if we could uh, adopt that amendment, I would be very grateful. And uh, now that you've explained it, I'll move the A7 amendment. And are there any questions on the amendment? Uh, Representative Quam, you you got your hand up, that's on the bill? Correct, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Quam. Um, members, if you want to un, um, unmute, all in favor of the A7 amendment, um, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. The, the amendment's been adopted. Um, with that, we'll go to our testifiers and then we'll get to questions. Uh, first person on my list is Ann Krisnick from the Joint Religious Legislative Coalition. Welcome to the committee and please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Ann Krisnick from the JRLC, which is made up of the Minnesota Council of Churches, the Minnesota Catholic Conference, the Jewish Community Relations Council, and the Islamic Center of Minnesota. And we're testifying to express concerns about the bill. In our churches and synagogues and other places of worship, um, when, what we see uh, about the impact of gambling currently is consistent with the findings of the 2020 study by the Wilder Foundation which when interviewing Minnesotans found that 22% of them had been negatively impacted by the problem gambling of someone around them. And under our current system, we see very real social costs, not just financial costs, but family breakdown and increase in divorce and domestic violence. We know that gambling addiction has the highest suicide rate, of, or excuse me, problem gambling has the highest suicide rate of any addiction. And we see a real impact on low income Minnesotans. That same Wilder study found that problem gambling was seven times more prevalent among people who had a high school diploma or a GED compared to people who had a professional or graduate degree who were much more likely to only engage in the entertaining aspects of gambling and not fall into problem gambling. So uh, first, I would really like to say thank you for the changes to raise that gambling age to 21. Minnesota is really an outlier among um, states to have any gambling age of 18. And um, there's a real risk if people in high school and freshmen and sophomore in college can vote. So we appreciate that change. Um, we think we need to look at a lot more support for people impacted by gambling. If I'm the person dealing with problem gambling, there's good support for me in Minnesota. But the families um, left behind with often devastating impacts are eligible for only up to 12 hours of counseling to deal with all of the many issues that, that um, are provided. And we think we need to do a lot more education of Minnesotans about the very real um, problems and dangers of gambling. We know that the operators are going to do a great job of talking about the entertainment value of gambling, and we need to make sure that Minnesotans understand what's at risk. So in closing, we don't feel we're at a point where we should be looking at expanding until we address some of these issues. But if there is any change, number one, um, very pleased to hear the change to raise the gambling age, uh, but we feel very strongly that this should be limited to in-person gambling. Someone physically has to go to a site to make that bet. We've heard about kind of what's going on with the neighboring states, and I just want to you know, make sure people are aware that only one of those, Iowa, is allowing mobile gambling. And they only did that after they had several years of in-person sports betting before they made that change. So we really urge you to um, not approve the mobile gambling, especially portions of this bill. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ms. Krisnick. If you want to hang around to answer questions, the next person I have on my list is Pat Gibbs. Um, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today related to authorizing and regulating mobile sports wagering in Minnesota. And thank you to Representative Stevenson and Garofalo for your continued willingness to work with my client and other stakeholders to create a sports wagering structure that works for Minnesota. My name is Pat Gibbs. I'm an attorney with the Oric Harrington and Sutcliffe Law Firm, uh, and it is my pleasure to serve as National Public Policy Counsel for the Sports Betting Alliance, or SBA. The SBA is a trade organization comprised of many of the top operators in the mobile sports wagering industry, DraftKings, FanDuel, Valleys, BetMGM, and Fanatics. And together, our members advocate for competitive mobile sports wagering in the United States. Although I represent the SBA and state capitals across the country, I'm particularly pleased to advocate for bringing this industry to Minnesota. As I grew up in Bloomington, graduated from Jefferson High School from the University of Minnesota, and am a native Minnesotan. It's great to be here. When considering the policies and impacts of regulating sports wagering, it is important to recognize that this would not bring a new activity to the state that Minnesotans have never seen before. Studies estimate that 1.1 million Minnesotans place $2.5 billion in illegal sports wagers annually using offshore sites on their phones and computers right now. These offshore sites do not care whether users placing a bet do so responsibly or whether they are extending themselves beyond a point they are comfortable with. These offshore sites do not use the best available technology to ensure their users aren't underage. And these offshore sites do not pay taxes to or cooperate with the state to assure best practices are carried out diligently. Alternatively, regulators in the uh, operators in the regulated mobile sports wagering market do take public safety and responsible gaming seriously. We want to provide the excitement of feeling a little extra invested in the outcome of a game while instituting the guardrails to do so responsibly. Not only is it just the right thing to do, but in a regulated market, the continued use of our license is conditioned upon our strict adherence to responsible gaming and any other provisions put in place by the state. Before I close, I would like to briefly mention just some of the public safety and responsible gaming benefits that come along with a regulated mobile sports wagering market. Regulated operators offer, the offer users the ability to limit the time they spend on sports betting apps, set a cap on their own daily, weekly, monthly deposit and wager amounts, and exclude themselves completely from engaging in that form of gaming. Regulated operators have dedicated player protection teams to support the monitoring of user accounts for potential problem gambling behavior and language. Regulated operators require all employees to receive responsible gaming training at onboarding and then periodically thereafter. Regulated operators work with health and research partners like Harvard Medical School's Cambridge Health Alliance Division on Addiction to inform strategic planning, material development, and advising on evidence-based efforts. Regulated operators provide substantial uh, responsible gaming resources and messaging directly in the sports wagering apps. Such resources include links to several self-help toolkits and the National Council on Problem Gambling screening tools. And regulated operators partner with organizations like the National Council on Problem Gambling, the American Gaming Association, the Responsible Gaming Conference, and more to promote the research of these issues and the funding to address them. With a regulated competitive mobile market, Minnesota looks to develop a safer environment for its 1.1 million existing sports bettors to operate within. Not only do regulated operators provide responsible gaming services directly, but this bill, as proposed, designates 40% of the generated tax revenue to a fund to address problem gambling. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. Uh, the next person on my list is Andy Plato, uh, Executive Director of the Minnesota Indian Gaming Association. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Andy Plato and I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Indian Gaming Association, or MIGA. MIGA represents 10 of the 11 tribes in Minnesota and appreciates the ability to provide comments on House File 778, Chair Stevenson's bill to authorize sports wagering. Since the federal law prohibiting states from legalizing sports wagering was overturned in 2018, Minnesota tribes and their leaders have closely watched as other states, including those surrounding Minnesota, have provided a legal marketplace for sports bettors. Of particular importance has been the impact sports wagering has had on other tribal gaming operations, as gaming provides the economic lifeblood of tribal governments, tribal communities, and the tens of thousands of Minnesotans they employ. Upon review, 
In many cases, the impact of sports wagering expansion has been a positive one, but only when the authorizing legislation is carefully crafted to ensure that tribes play a critical role in bringing the marketplace to consumers. Tribal leaders continue to review the proposal and hope to soon be as comfortable with the details as they currently are with the general framework. But in concept, House File 778 does recognize that tribes, as the state's gaming experts, are best positioned to operate Minnesota's sports betting market, both in retail and mobile environments. For these reasons, I am pleased to ask the committee to approve the bill today. MIGA and individual tribes will continue to offer their input in good faith as the bill moves through the process. Tribal leaders and staff would like to offer our thanks to Chair Stevenson for his respectful engagement on this issue and wish to continue our conversations with the legislature and other stakeholders to ensure any expansion of off-reservation gaming benefits both tribes and the Minnesota sports betting public. Chair Nelson and members, thank you again for the ability to provide comments and for your willingness to consider tribal voices throughout this process. I stand ready to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Plato. Um, the next person on my list is Mr. Kruger, Sam Kruger, Executive Director of the Electronic Gaming Group. Mr. Kruger, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you so much for having me in today. My name is Sam Krieger, and I am the Executive Director of the Electronic Gaming Group. Uh, we are a trade association that represents uh, licensed charitable organizations that operate electronic games, e-game manufacturers, distributors, and others in the e-gaming industry. I'm here today to express my organization's strong concerns with this bill. To be clear, we are not against sports betting in general, but we are against bills that allow our chief competitors, the tribes, to vastly expand their operations outside of their existing jurisdictions without allowing the charities a reasonable path to compete and grow going forward. We have heard again and again, whether it is from the authors of this bill or from the media headlines, that this puts the tribes in charge of sports betting, the largest expansion of gaming in Minnesota in 40 years. They have been referred to as the experts, while people make almost no mention of the nearly $3 billion industry that is charitable gambling. Charitable gambling is done in thousands of locations across the state and in every single one of your districts. The tribes are not the only game in town when it comes to gambling, and this bill is picking winners and losers in this industry. We appreciate that the authors want to use some of this funding for youth sports, but this does not address our issues. Because our charities do not just fund sports teams, they fund veterans programs, food shelves, snowmobile clubs, community groups, and many, many other programs in all of your communities. This concern of ours is exacerbated because of the tribe's ongoing attempts to dismantle the state's electronic charitable gambling environment by banning e-pull tabs as we know them. We have asked and will continue to ask the authors of this legislation to allow my organization and others like it to be a part of this conversation in a meaningful way so that we can find a solution that will not jeopardize the integrity and the financial well-being of our charities. Thank you. Uh, I'll be here for any questions, and our lobbyist, Ray Bowen, will also be here to assist me. And I see that on my list that Ray Bowen's here if needed. Um, thank you, Mr. Krager. Um, the next person on my list is uh, Mr. Grassel, the Citizens Against Gambling Expansion. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Jake Grassel, and I'm, I'm here today on behalf of Citizens Against Gambling Expansion to speak in opposition to this bill, which would result in the largest expansion of gambling in the past 40 years in our state, and the financial implications could be staggering. The estimated annual cost of a pathological gambler, gambler is $1,200, and a problem gambler is about $715, which based upon our demographics could result in approximately $197 million in annual costs to the state due to crime, business, unemployment costs, bankruptcy, illness, social services costs, family costs, and abuse costs, among others. This is especially 
important to note for this bill as sports bettors have higher rates of problem gambling at 5.7% compared with adults that bet at casinos, bought lottery tickets, raffle tickets, or made private bets. And even worse, for the first time in our state's history, we are looking to legalize online betting and gamblers who bet online had even higher problem gambling rates at 18.2%. What are some of the ancillary and social costs to our state? 20 to 30% of pathological gamblers have declared bankruptcy with an average cost of $39,000 per bankruptcy to creditors. 90% of pathological gamblers gamble their paychecks or family savings and over 30% reported gambling debts of 75 to $150,000 including money borrowed from family members. In the long run, who will pay for this? Who will pay for this gambling and who will it most affect? Minnesota's youth, who are also the most at risk, as studies show the younger you begin gambling, the more likely you are to become a problem gambler. We know that problem gambling will grow as sports betting leads to higher proportions of problem gambling. And studies have consistently shown that the closer a person lives to a gambling terminal, the more likely they are to become a problem gambler. And this bill, as it stands, puts a gambling terminal in the hands of every Minnesotan, including those in Minnesota high schools, as it stands today. We do appreciate the author's assurances to increase the gambling age on mobile gambling to 21. Or by creating a marketplace for this next generation to gamble from their couch, coffee shop, or dorm room, we are creating a generation that will lose their hard-earned monies and likely their future to betting on entertainment. This bill, this bill poses serious risk to our state's finances and to the finances of future generations and deserves a more thoughtful study than it can receive during this short legislative session. I encourage you to shelve it and study it before jumping on this destructive bandwagon. This bill is a bad bet for Minnesota. Please vote no. Uh, thank you, and I will uh, remain for any questions. And questions I see I've got hands up already. Representative Quam, your hand was up first. Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, again, the main justification we're hearing is it's happening anyway. So let the state uh, legalize it and we can tax it and, and gain money. Um, I've heard that with the legalizing uh, undocumented pharmacists or illegal drug trade, uh, prostitution. Um, I haven't heard it with uh, selling human organs and some of the other things that happen, but are uh, you know, illegal, but they're not looking at gaining money from it. The big issue that this bill has none address, no addressing on, is when a dagger was put into so many local programs with the excessive uh, taxation on that was added to charitable gambling. Uh, those are programs in small communities across the state that uh, not only helped out with, with youth sports, but helped out with a lot of uh, community activities, a lot of needed uh, ways that, uh, you know, we don't have in this bill. Um, whenever we've tried to bring up dropping that tax, cutting that tax on charitable gambling, we keep hearing, it. how are we gonna pay for it? Well, if this bill is going to bring in so much money, why don't we get rid of that tax on charitable gambling? And that's a question to the author of the bill. Representative Stevenson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Quam. Um, I wanna be clear about a few things. The, to answer your question directly, the bill does not directly relate to, to charitable gaming and the taxes on charitable gaming. I know there's a big conversation to be had about that. Uh, people are raising the issue of e-poll tabs and charitable gaming. To me, that is a separate conversation and one worth having, but not one that is happening in the context uh, of this bill. Um, I, I don't think this really has anything to do with charitable gaming. As you heard Mr. Gibbs testify, there's already two point two and a half billion dollars worth of illegal sports betting occurring in Minnesota through online markets. So uh, that's the pot of money that will move into this legitimate market, not really impacting uh, charitable gaming. I also want to push back on the idea that this is going to generate a lot of revenue. 
for the state or the reason why we're doing this is to generate a lot of revenue for the state. Uh, sports betting is a high volume but low margin business. And we're trying to keep the tax rate as low as we possibly can uh, to encourage people to move out of the uh, black market and into the legitimate market. Again, this bill is not about expanding gambling. It's about taking gambling that's already occurring and moving it into the, the regulated uh, sector so that we can address the concerns that happen, the very legitimate concerns that you've heard today related to problem gaming and other impacts uh, uh, through the, the legal system. So I, I don't expect that it, this is gonna be a financial uh, windfall for the state, both because I just don't think there's that much uh, revenue to be generated and also because we're keeping the tax rate uh, as low as we, we possibly can. So to answer your question, I'm not opposed to dealing with that in, a, in another uh, bill, uh, in the tax bill or in another bill uh, uh, in terms of dealing with uh, the tax relief, but uh, this bill uh, relates specifically to sports betting. Representative Kwong. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, yeah, that, that response uh, reminds me of, of male bovine byproduct. Um, there is no way that you can say that a bill on gambling and taxing gambling is unrelated to taxes on charitable gambling. And I am tired of the excuses that are thrown anytime we try to help greater Minnesota's uh, communities. Um, and, and it just seems disingenuous to say, oh, it's totally not related. Uh, the, and that we're not doing this because we want money for the state. It's out of the goodness of our hearts because this will help so many people. Um, I mean, let's have an honest conversation and look at the entire scope. And then maybe we can uh, get a few more uh, people that consider voting for this bill. So um, because of that response, I don't see a way I can vote for this. Thank you, Representative Kwong. Representative Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the author. Um, I, I want to start with, um, the, I appreciate that we are talking about bringing this into the light. Um, but I also understand that when we make something available, we also potentially expand access and normalize that activity. Um, and as I'm sure the gentleman here uh, talking about representing gaming companies, there's always a desire as well that that will expand that market um, into a place where it has not previously existed. And so I have still have concerns about that. I wanna thank the author for upping the age, um, that certainly addresses one question. And I do have a question for Mr. Gibbs specifically on that point. So he mentioned that they, uh, there are various ways to limit your spending uh, voluntarily. He also mentioned that there were ways to um, potentially find a link to seek help if you have a gambling problem. Although it's my, in my experience that most gamblers rarely ever seek help on their own. Um, but my question is this, he said that it would be safer to have this online because there are protections in place to ensure that individuals cannot spend over their means. And I'm curious, they said they were monitoring those systems to find where there may be problems. But I wanna know specifically from Mr. Gibbs, what actual steps are taken when a problem is found to make sure that we are limiting an individual's ability to abuse uh, gambling. Mr. Gibbs. Right, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the question. Um, when I was making the comments about the safety of the regulated market, it was more in comparison to the existing online gaming that's going on right now that's unregulated. So um, in Minnesota, when I refer to the 1.1 million Minnesotans who are making these um, sports bets currently, these are individuals using websites that you could access right now. You could probably place a bet offshore um, in one of these companies based in the Bahamas before the end of my question. Um, they're that accessible. And when I'm comparing the safety aspects, 
It's really about the regulated market, the operators that would enter this market versus the existing, um, the existing operators that exist. And so uh, when you're talking about these, um, these frameworks that are in place, it's more, uh, it's more that these <laughs> offshore operators don't offer anything. And in the, in the regulated market, Yes, individuals have the ability to set their own limits based on dollar amount, based on deposit amount, based on um, a, a, like a number of things. But these just don't exist in the unregulated market. And when uh, alternatively, when an operator is monitoring for this, um, we need to uh, be able to detect deviations from a better's typical pattern. Because what may be a comfortable amount for, you know, Mark Zuckerberg to bet is not the same amount that's comfortable for me to bet. So really, it's monitoring deviations from a pattern, um, something that is out of the ordinary for that better, and then that um, that leads the operator to reach out to that individual and make an assessment as to whether they are betting outside of their means, and then there's an intervention process. Mr. Dr. Bonner. Mr. Chair? Okay. Who's speaking? This is uh, Representative Stevenson. Representative Stevenson. I just wanted to briefly add uh, to, 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 to this point that uh, we are including language in the bill, Representative Bonner, that requires operators to include the types of controls you were referencing in terms of placing uh, self-limiting on bets or scheduling timeouts, self-limiting deposits, and making that conspicuous and accessible. So when you're in, in operation, uh, you, you can limit yourself on the on the front end, and that will be that's in the legis that will be in the legislation that that those uh, features have to be in all of the platforms. Representative Bonner, thank you for that, uh, Representative Stevenson and and Mr. Gibbs, and I and I certainly am grateful that those items are included, but I just want to say that a lot of folks who have issues with gambling, I'm not really sure that some of those measures are a very good deterrent. Um, so I guess I would love to see more assurances that those interventions, when we do find patterns that are breaking the norm, um, that those are solidified and more clear, um, because it just really feels like that is one way that we could potentially have an impact here on this market that I'm not really hearing. I'm hearing we, we're noticing the pattern, we're potentially intervening. We're not actually taking steps to uh, stop someone from actually spending well over their limit. Um, and so I, I would just want to make sure that we have clear boundaries around that particular piece. And again, thank you, Representative Stevenson, for hearing our request to push that up to 21 from the previous 18. Uh, that d was helpful. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just a point of information, um, seems like there is a lot of discussion, relevant question to this committee. Uh, I hope that the committee will have ample time to, to vet this bill and help uh, the author flesh out. Um, so I have a number of questions. Um, what is the, uh, the chair's, how are we gonna handle this? Are we gonna run out of time or just jam it through? Um, can we, just, just so Representative, Representative Kosnick, we've been given permission to go a little later today, but uh, if we can keep our questions short and we can keep our answers short, we can get through this today. We have another bill that is an important bill that we need to get passed also. So Representative Kosnick, ask, you, ask your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do recognize that there is another bill on the agenda of importance. However, uh, this is a critical uh, and uh, a critical bill that impacts our state and, and the fine, uh, the purview of this committee. Um, I'd like to first ask um, on if we could talk a little bit about uh, Section 15, uh, the governor, the governor's designee uh, to be able to uh, enter into uh, compacts on this. Is, is it typical that the governor, uh, the executive branch can do that outside of legislative authority, or are we ceding legislative authority in this area through this bill? If the officer or staff could ask answer. Representative Stevenson. 
Uh, yeah, I can, Mr. Chair and Reps. I can't answer that. That is typical. Uh, the compact is an agreement between the the governor and and the tribes. You can look next door to Wisconsin, where uh, compacts were just entered on this issue without legislative involvement, as an example. Or you could look back in our own history at the earlier compacts. So this is, uh, frankly, we don't even need to pass Section 15 uh, for the governor to do this with the tribes. Representative Kosnick. Well, I. It raises a little bit of a concern of legislative um, authority, and, and so if, if it's listed in the bill, I think that it indicates that the legislature is ceding some authority to the executive branch, and so I'd like to um, work on that a little bit uh, more. Uh, we did talk a lot about the, the issue of uh, gambling addiction and, and such, and I do have some, some of my own comments on that, but uh, Representative Stevenson um, you, you talked about you visited with a number of the the tribes uh, and visited Iowa. Um, did you have discussions uh, with like the state lottery, or the the racing commission, or the gambling control board, who actually has expertise in Minnesota for a very long time? Uh, and uh, on this, have, have you had discussions with them? And are they supportive? Are they do they have concerns? What were those discussions like? Representative Stevenson and members, I've just been notified that we have permission to come back tonight. So, um, Representative Stevenson, I want to answer the question. Mr. Chair, Representative Kosnick, uh, yes. The answer to your question is all the entities that you've mentioned, I did have conversations uh, with, uh, along with many more. I, you, the, um, the state agencies that you referenced don't, aren't taking a position uh, on, on this bill. Uh, I've certainly had conversations with all of them. And I, I don't. I can't remember what non-state agencies you you mentioned, but I don't think that they're taking uh, a position. But I've, everyone, I was checking off the list as you went through. I talked to everyone. Chair, you mentioned. if I could, if I could assist the author and, and represent represent Kosnick, um, I'm going to lay this over. We're going to okay. come. We're going to come back tonight at five o'clock, um, and uh, we'll do this. We'll continue this conversation on this bill tonight. Um, I think we so have I'm going to lay this bill at five o'clock tonight, Mr. Chair. What's that? I think we have caucus at five o'clock. Oh, wait, today's Tuesday. Never mind. Today's Tuesday. Well, um, we're going to come back tonight at five o'clock and continue this bill. Um, there seems to be a lot more questions on this bill. And so I'm going to lay this over till then. Um, thank you, Representative Stevenson. And, uh, and members, uh, I'm going to take up. Next, we're going to move to Representative Jordan's bill. Um, I hope this will go a little quicker. I'll move that House file 4169 be referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, Representative Representative uh, Jordan, if you want to explain your bill. Sure, Mr. Chair. Do you want me to explain the bill or do you want me to explain the amendment to my bill? Uh, is it, it's a D amendment. I'll, I'll move the DE1 amendment. And Representative Jordan, you want to explain the DE1 amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, this amendment is was written in consultation with SBI. It adds the Republic of Belarus to this bill in addition to the Russian Federation. It also cleans up and clarifies definitions, provides direction for disinvestment, and makes other technical changes. And I ask for your support to get the bill in the shape that I would like to proceed with. So members, I'll, the, the DE1 amendments in front of us, I move the DE1 amendment. Um, uh, Everybody wants to unmute and we'll vote on the DE1 amendment to put the bill in the shape the uh, author wants. All in favor of the DE1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. The bill's in the shape the, the author wants. There's the A1 amendment, Representative Quam. Um, yes, Mr. Chair. And Basically, if we're going to, uh, uh, the action we're doing is because there's a government that, that's doing atrocities and behaving badly. And frankly, the treatment of the Uyghurs, of Muslims and Christians in China for decades has been having atrocities. And the fact that uh, the agreements before they, uh, did this latest invasion Russia had with China, where China would backfill and assist with uh, military and bypass any sanctions by uh, buying their goods 
and then China would be selling uh, oil and other goods in the market. Uh, so subverting uh, those sanctions. I think uh, it's more than appropriate China be included in this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And Representative Jordan, what is your pleasure with the of the of the amendment, A1 amendment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Quam. I would respectfully ask community members to vote against the Quam amendment as the purpose of this bill is to condemn Putin's invasion and human rights abuses in Ukraine. Belarus has directly enabled the Russian regime um, and adding China to this list would open up the bill more than we should at this time. But I do welcome working with Representative Quam on human rights abuses and um, condemning them across the world. M M Mr. Chair, the, the part of the point that I have with Representative this, Quam. Thank you, Mr. Chair, is the fact that China is subverting these very measures that we're trying to do here in the international community. So they are fully facilitating the bad acting and they premeditatedly did it before. So that is, is why it would be um, hollow to pass this bill without including China. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The FAT members, um, if you want to unmute, all in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? No. 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 The no's, the nays have it. The amendment is not adopted. We have uh, two testifiers uh, here, and if you can go quickly, we need to get to get to a vote on this. Um, uh, Miss Betsy Hayes, you want to identify yourself for the record and proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chair. My name is Betsy Hayes. I'm the Chief Procurement Officer with the State of Minnesota, and I don't have any direct testimony. I'm just here to answer questions if there are any. Okay, thank you for that. The next one I have, and maybe it's the same thing, Miss Luda, and I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce your last name. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. My name is Luda Anastasievsky, and I am Minnesota Ukrainian American Advocacy Committee Chair. The Advocacy Committee represents the Ukrainian American community in the state of Minnesota and coordinates Ukrainian community advocacy work. There are over 17,000 Ukrainians in the state of Minnesota, and I'm also a board member of the Ukrainian American Community Center in Minneapolis. I'm grateful to Mr. Roberts and the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas for spearheading the effort to introduce this bill. Chair Nelson and members of the committee, as a Minnesotan and a Ukrainian American, I am honored and privileged to speak to you today in support of Bill HF 4165, the Russia Divorcement Bill. I was born in Mariupol, a city in southeastern Ukraine on the Zov Sea, and spent my childhood and youth there. I have been living in Minnesota since 1990. I am an educator, and I have been teaching in Minnesota public schools for 30 years. Since the renewed aggression of the Russian Federation on February 24th, I can barely function. I, do not, I cannot sleep well. I have a hard time focusing. I feel very anxious and worried because my family and friends in Mariupol are in a city under siege. I do not know how any of them are doing or even if they're alive because communication has been impossible. I lost touch with them on February 27th. Currently, Mariupol is enduring its third week of heavy shelling. Russia has dropped roughly 100, 100 bombs on the city of Mariupol since the siege of the city began, with at least 22 bombings taking place in a single 24-hour span. The new satellite images of Mariupol that appeared this weekend have revealed shocking scenes of death and destruction. Russian bombardment has now caused more than 2,000 deaths in the city, according to some estimates. Last week, a maternity ward at a city clinic was destroyed by a direct hit. Three people were killed, 17 wounded. As a result of that hit, a mother and a baby died. Overburdened with corpses left on the streets, city already started burials in mass graves. According to Doctors Without Borders, the humanitarian situation in Mariupol is catastrophic. 
hundreds of thousands of cities' residents are now facing extreme or total shortages of basic necessities, such as food, water, and medicine. People of all ages are sheltering in unheated basement, risking their lives to make short runs outside for food and water. Um, Ms. Anna, Ms. Anna, um, Anna, what, Anastasievsky. Anyway. Yes. Yeah, Anna Shalesky, yeah. Uh, we need to lay this bill over. We have to we have to recess at 1010, and we're at that point. Um, we'll bring this bill back. I'm going to lay this bill over. We'll bring this bill back up tonight. Uh, we have questions. We have, um, and we'll go from there. And so, members, we are coming back tonight at 5 p.m. We will reconvene. Um, you can use the same Zoom link that you used this morning to come back, and we'll lay this bill over. And with that, members, we are in recess till, till 5 p.m. tonight. Thank you.